Hey everybody, it's Dr. Eric Balkavage and Dr. Erica Riggleman. We're back for another edition of Thyroid Answers Podcast. And today we have um, a new topic, but let me say hi to Dr. Erica. Erica, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day in September mm -hmm. uh, and I'm downstairs, right? In, <laughs> in your dungeon. In my dungeon doing some work. So we are going to talk about you know, a lot of our patients come into our practices already taking a bunch of supplementation because they're looking for solutions to lose weight or improve their energy. Um, they're trying to they're trying to fix it, right? And that's the big challenge: is everybody's looking for the the kind of the magic supplement. We see that all the time on on blogs and posts from people like, "Hey, if you take this supplement, it'll fix this. It'll fix that." And I think our philosophy on a lot of this stuff is, is that uh, there isn't a magic supplement. It would be great if there was, right? Uh, but there isn't one that fixes uh, the thyroid gland. There isn't a magic supplement that fixes uh, the cellular hypothyroidism. What, the biggest thing we need to do is reduce whatever those cellular stressors are, what, reduce what's triggering autoimmunity, reduce the toxicity, improve the lifestyle factors that we always talk about. Um, but when we see people come into our practices, we often see people already taking a list of oh, supplements yeah. that we have to then kind of wean out, right? And so yeah. I think that in our society, you know, whether it be TV commercials or we're in a we want it fixed now and we we're often misled to believe that there's a pill for everything whether it's a medication commercial you see on TV or, you know, there's even supplement commercials on there that are like, you know, they, they, this, this supplement fixes everything. This will, this is for your eye health. And this one's, and you'll see that on patient paperwork when they come in, I take this supplement for my eyes and this supplement for my bones. And they're, they're on like 15 to 20 of these supplements. And when you actually start to look at some of them, you have to question, you've been on this for 20 years is it really doing you that much good? Let's try to fix the underlying problem. And so I think that supplements can often, I think there's a time and a place for them, just like anything in, in healthcare, whether it's medications or therapies or supplements, there's, there's a time and a place, but I think they're often misused and, and often unnecessary. Absolutely. And I think one of the things is what people don't realize, and I don't blame them, right? If I didn't feel good and we weren't in this business, we would be looking for the magic pure, cure as well, because everybody's looking for the easy answer out. But um, it, often those things can give a temporary benefit, but they don't provide long-term success. And, you know, medications are the same way, right? You know, medications are designed to give a quick response. They actually may, in many cases, do a better job giving a quick response. Uh, the problem is the, the effects and the side effects that can occur from those things. And we're not getting to the root issue. And we have to have make, make sure that the people who listen to, the, to our podcasts and the patients we see realize that if you're going to try and fix things by just dumping more gobs of more nutrients into the system, uh, that's really doing the same thing that medicine's doing. It's just trying to treat by giving something external instead of saying, hey, what's going on here that's changing the physiology? And just like you can overdose with medications, you can overdose with supplementation without a doubt. You can definitely overdo Bs, you can overdo vitamin D, you can overdo a number of things. So we wanted to cover five, and I think maybe a six we'll talk about, um, supplements that patients might be taking, people who we see come into the practice or people listening to this podcast that might be taking uh, for good reasons, right? Because they've been told, they've read a blog, they've, uh, they've been you know, told by their doctor, well, you really need this. Um, and they're taking those and they're actually probably though that supplement may be actually inhibiting uh, or altering their thyroid physiology and causing some symptomatology, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we want to get into a couple of those, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, probably one of those places to start is let's start with the kind of uh, the superstar supplement right now, the one that everybody talks about, even though it's still September and still sunny and beautiful out, uh, is vitamin D, right? Correct. Yeah. Everybody's a big fan of vitamin D because everybody's deficient in vitamin D and therefore everybody needs it. And vitamin D is supposed to reduce thyroid antibody levels and kind of and fix everything. 
So do you see a lot of your patients coming in on high, high dose vitamin D? Absolutely. And, and, and whether they, they used to be on a high dose, maybe it was prescribed and now they're, they're on just like a maintenance dose of it. Um, yeah, I see a lot of people who are taking the vitamin D and, and again, they, they have always have good reasons for it. Oh, I was low. I have to be on it or, oh, I want to boost up my immune system. I don't want to get sick this year or, you know, I'm trying to prevent, you know, the flu or I'm just trying to get ahead of it. You know, I, I was told that I have to always be taking vitamin D and it's vitamin D. How is it going to hurt me? Type of mentality is a lot of the patients that come in, um, that I see taking the vitamin D and I often, you know, we've. We did a whole podcast about vitamin D, and I think that there's some crucial components that, you know, I think it has a place, but I also think that there needs to be special testing done to know whether you particularly need that or not. Right. We did the, the podcast, I think we called to D or not to D. That mm -hmm. is the question, right? And so when we think about vitamin D, and for the, for the listeners, we'll just kind of rehash this a little bit. There's really two forms of vitamin D that we can measure. One is called 25 OHD which, okay, so let me back up a little bit. You have vitamin D that you're, you get from the sun that makes vitamin D in your skin from cholesterol, and you get vitamin D from your supplements. Both of those come in as vitamin D into the, uh, they're into the bloodstream as vitamin D, but to be converted into what we call the measurable, one of the measurable forms, 25 OHD, uh, that, that vitamin D has to get transported to the liver, uh, and then at the liver, the vitamin D is converted to 25 OHD, which is like the storage form of vitamin D. It's like the pro hormone. It's not quite ready for use. It actually has to be converted into 125 vitamin D to actually be active beneficial. Um, and so there are a lot of people that are told um, that they need to um, they need to take vitamin D because their vitamin D is low. But the only thing that's being measured is the 25 OHD. And if they only measure the 25 OHD, then you don't know if you had a hard time converting it from sun exposure. You don't know if you're not in, in digesting it or absorbing it from your diet. Um, you don't know if you have an inability to convert it at the liver. Uh, and then the 25 to 125 conversion occurs at the renal system, the kidneys. And so you don't know if you're having a problem with the conversion from 25 to 125, or you don't know if the 25 or the 125 is being deactivated to a 24 or a 124. And so just measuring 25 OHD doesn't quite tell you if you have a deficiency. And, if, and one of those keys we talked about on the on that you know, whole hour podcast was every step of that pathway actually requires magnesium. And so if you have magnesium deficiency because of malabsorption syndrome, you don't eat foods that are rich in vitamin D, you have you drink a lot of alcohol, you have a lot of stress, you have iron toxicity, all of those things uh, can uh, and more can diminish magnesium. So if there's a magnesium deficiency, you, you might be deficient, but you might not. We recommend that we you take a look at both 25 OHD and 125 OHD, and if your 25 OHD is should be about 1.3 times higher than your 125 OHD. So, people look at the kind of the ranges and they say, "Hey, um, 25 OHD mm -hmm. should be like you know 70 to 100 or something like that," um, and that maybe that's right. Um, but what I tell most people to do is just kind of keep an eye. And I think that range somewhere closer to that in that 40 range is probably appropriate, uh, maybe even a little bit higher, but as long as that 25 OHD is kind of, you know, over 40 and it's 1.3 times higher than the 25, than the 125 OHD, you probably don't need more vitamin D. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but if your 125 is elevated above the 25 OHD, then you have an increased conversion to 125 OHD. And now in this situation, you definitely don't need more, but your labs may look low because the high 125D will actually inhibit the conversion from vitamin D to 25 OHD. So what's the big deal? And why would that impact um, thyroid physiology? 
I, I mean, the, I think the number one reason is the upregulation of the inflammatory cascade. And we know any sort of inflammation can then start to affect the cellular level. And any sort of cellular inflammation can, can reduce the ability of the thyroid hormone to get in and do it's essentially its job. And you yeah. can have thyroid symptoms from that. Yeah, so everybody talks about vitamin D being really good because it can lower thyroid antibodies, right? And so if it, there's two sides to that immune system, Th1, Th2. Uh, Th2 is more the antibody side. Th1 is more the, the innate immune system side. And so if you take high dose vitamin D, vitamin D at the high level 125 will actually shut down that antibody production. So I think mistakenly sometimes we think that if we, if we raise that level up really high, then it'll lower the thyroid antibodies and we fix the thyroid condition. But what you just said was and really important, which is while it may reduce the antibody side, it actually may increase the innate immune side, which may increase the inflammation and actually cause more thyroid hormone deactivation. And that's not what you want. So it may be the fact that you might've been told that, hey, you gotta take high dose vitamin D because you're always low, A, check both 25 and 125. And then if your 125 is higher, that one higher 125 may have lowered your thyroid antibodies, but it may actually be creating more problems with inflammation and thyroid hormone deactivation, right? I think, I think a key thing to understand is that just having lower antibodies on a lab test doesn't mean that your thyroid function is better. I mean, that's, that's just as bad as them trying to whack a mole in your labs into that normal range and you still have symptoms just because the labs look normal doesn't mean that your physiology and your body is working appropriately so you're, you're having one trade-off yes those labs are are maybe better in range but you're probably still going to have thyroid symptoms if it's causing more cellular resistance right and we have to ask that question right why are the ele antibodies elevated to begin with? If your belief is that it's just a mistake by the body and then and the, the immune system's out of control, then that might be, then suppressing antibodies may be the right answer. But if you look at it like, hey, the immune system is reacting for a reason and maybe we need to uncover the reason and just suppressing the antibody response may not be the best scenario in all cases, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, we talk about this all the time when, when we talk about blood sugar problems, right? Somebody's insulin resistant. So let's give them something to force insulin, to make them less insulin uh, resistant. But maybe their tissues are insulin resistant for a really good reason. Maybe there's chronic infection inside those cells and therefore the cells don't want more glucose and insulin in the cell. And by forcing it in with some type of medication or even a supplement, are we creating more problems? And so I think we, you have to ask that question. So vitamin D could be a thing that even though there's a lot of discussion that it may, that everybody should be taking high dose vitamin D, I don't think that's the case. I don't think Dr. Erica agrees with that either. I think you have to assess and interpret labs appropriately versus just doing blanket recommendations. When you read a blog and it says, everybody who's got autoimmunity should take 10,000 IUs a day of vitamin D, suppress their antibodies. Uh, no, that's not the way to go, okay? That is, that's a formula, but it's not your formula when it comes to it. All right, so what's right. the next one? Um, I think this next one is a very common thing. People may be taking it, they don't even realize it. Um, and that would be carnitine. Okay. So carnitine is one of those things that people use to increase fat loss, right? So our hypothyroid patients, whether they know they're hypothyroid, they don't know they're hypothyroid, but they're struggling with weight issues. And what you'll see a lot of times is people say, hey, you need more carnitine. Carnitine is what brings fatty acids into the mitochondria so your body can burn those fatty acids as energy versus using glucose. And so you see a lot of people doing ketogenic diets or trying to do higher fat diets that are trying to use L-carnitine to help support it. So it sounds good on the surface, right? That whole part sounded good, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, it helps. If I take L-carnitine, it'll help me burn fat. Therefore, I'll lose more weight and that should work. And what I've seen, and I've done it to patients, so I know this firsthand because I read the same, the, the information and or I went to the same seminars that these people went to too. And I started giving people L-carnitine in, high, in higher doses to try and force their metabolism years ago. And what I would see is my patients going, hey, I'm gaining weight. 
And I was like, you can't be gaining weight because you're not eating carbohydrates and I'm forcing your fat map mobilization. And I didn't understand why. And then a couple of years ago, I actually came across a paper um, that said L-carnitine inhibits thyroid hormone transport into these cells, which, hmm, what I did to my patient was cause them to have cellular hypothyroidism by putting them on high dose L-carnitine. So if you are taking L-carnitine, it is one of the things that you could be taking for a good reason, but could actually cause your thyroid hormone physiology in your peripheral cells. Thyroid gland is fine. If you're on the meds, it could be fine. It's about how much thyroid hormone gets into the cell. So you can induce a cellular hypothyroid state. I think it's important to look at all your supplements because again, maybe it, a lot of people who have thyroid issues are going to try to work out because they want to lose more weight. And a lot of these workout supplements are going to have L-carnitine built in there. Um, there's even, I know in a, a lot of uh, realms, the weight loss realm, they're doing these MIC shots, which contains the carnitine. So they're giving you a, it's called the lipo shot. So they give you an injection of amino acids. It contains um, the carnitine. And so it's for a good reason, but you may be getting exposed to it on many levels without you even knowing you're getting exposed to it, which could be hindering that function. Yeah. So you're going to find it in things like the fat, fat burners, maybe the metabolism supplements. You just check your supplements to find out if you're taking it, especially if you started a supplement and your metabolism seems like it's slowing down and you're not getting improvements. Check for L-carnitine. All right. What do we got next? Uh, milk thistle. So this is a common herb that's in a lot of liver detox supplements. And so we've obviously talked about liver detox on this podcast before and how we think that that's, the liver is so very important. So people think a little detox is good. A lot of detox is even better, right? So they're often taking this on a daily basis or taking it in high doses, trying to promote detoxification, which can cause some thyroid issues. Yeah, absolutely. It's again, the same mechanism as the L-carnitine. It can actually decrease T3. Um, th there's something called the MCT8 transporter. So it can decrease the transport of thyroid hormone into the cells. So in an effort to try and force uh, to support detoxification, you may actually cause uh, hypothyroidism of your liver cells. And therefore, you're doing one thing to try and help support detoxification, but you're doing another thing to inhibit detoxification because you need thyroid hormone for the detoxification pathways to work well. So milk thistle is going to be, check any of those products that you're purchasing or that you've been prescribed that has milk thistle in it. You know, there's a, for some people, they're fine with it. Smaller dose, they may be fine. But again, it's one of those things that you find in a ton of different gallbladder support formulas. Uh, and uh, I ha I've just seen it in the literature and the research um, that it, it does it, uh, but I think the amount it, it can, it is probably variable for everybody depending on everything else that's going on. But I definitely am, have really started to move away or make sure that anything that I'm using, and it's hard to avoid it sometimes in these, some of these products that you want to use to help with liver physiology, um, is to have as, as small a dose as possible or to not have it at all. Because there's a lot of good products that'll help with liver physiology and opening up the natural detoxification pathways uh, versus, um, versus milk thistles. So it is good, but it can induce a, more of a hypothyroid. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be like, just like with anything, I wouldn't be 100% afraid of it. I think that there's, you know, it can be useful in a very small, short-term amount. Mm -hmm. I know in, in, in my practice, when I'm working with clients and patients, I'm, I'm always trying to fix the cellular issues and all the foundational stuff first. And then if we're going to do any sort of detox or, you know, even a liver cleanse or it's way down the road, it's, you know, three months down the road into us already fixing all the underlying stuff. And we do it for a very short period of time. And then we stop it. It's, there's a lot of people who constantly are taking liver detox supplements because again, they think that a liver, little bit of liver detox is good. Why not be detoxifying and pushing those pathways on a daily basis all the time year round, which then 
in, in the long scheme of things, you really can shut down a lot of your thyroid physiology. Yeah. What's interesting in some of those detox products, the products that support uh, phase one may shut down phase two and the products that, that support phase two may shut down phase three, or you may have some, or phase one, I should say. And then you may have things that actually um, inhibit, you know, 2.5, which is opening up the doors, as Kelly Halderman would say, to get toxins out of the system. So it's not about just pump and pump, pump, pump more stuff in. It's about doing what's appropriate for a patient. And that comes back to uh, really evaluating or interpreting labs versus just reading labs from a higher low or going to a seminar and getting the, hey, 30 days of gut protocol, then we do 30 days of uh, liver protocol. And then, you know, in between there we do, then we do the next protocol. If you're just following protocols for every patient, it, it may not work, right? And it may actually create some problems. Our, our job as, as the doctors, especially helping people out, is to make sure that we interpret what's appropriate. And especially if we know that we have somebody who's got thyroid physiology issues going on, we want to, might want to be a lot more cautious about using something like L-carnitine or milk thistle. But if they don't have those issues and we're pulsing it in there, it may not be a big deal. But definitely if you're a, if you're a person who's trying to lose or trying to get your thyroid physiology under control and you're using detox products as your kind of go-to thing because you read that maybe on a blog post or saw a video and you're taking the products that have these things in them and you're struggling or your weight's going up or you're more tired or more fatigued, uh, then, or, you know, your hair is getting worse, then you want to be really cautious and start taking a look at what's in your supplements. Exactly. And to kind of piggyback off the supporting the liver and the biliary function, the next one that could be problematic that a lot of thyroid patients are taking is going to be like an ox bile or a, uh, like a bile um, salt. The big thing with that, you have to understand a lot of these thyroid patients have either had their gallbladder removed and are told to be on ox bile, or they know that they're having biliary issues, so they're trying out the supplement, which could, in you know, the grand scheme of things, be shutting down some thyroid physiology. Yeah, and what the way kind of that you're going to probably see some changes with the ox bile is kind of interesting because ox bile will, can, when it gets into the bloodstream then it can float around into the bloodstream and it's actually can increase the conversion of T4 to T3. So what I've seen in, in my practice is, cause I've, again, you know, I was following somebody's advice, like, Hey, ox bile is awesome. And you give the ox bile to somebody and all of a sudden they are now having their hair spinning and they're not, they maybe they're increased their anxiousness or their anxiety, or they're not feeling as good. Uh, maybe getting hypothyroid symptoms, but maybe you're getting more hyperthyroid symptoms even. And so uh, why does that happen? Because if they're getting more ox bile that they're taking and they're getting more of it resorbed from the, from the GI tract and it's getting in the bloodstream, then it can stimulate those TGR5 receptors, increase the conversion of T4 uh, to T3, and then it can upregulate certain tissues. If we get more upregulation in the brain, T4 to T3, especially like at the hypothalamic area then or the pituitary area, then we'll, what's going to happen is we're going to get more T4 to T3. We're going to get suppression of TRH and TSH, and then the gland's not going to get the signal to make as much T4 and T3. So it can induce a hypothyroid state that way. But it can, it can as much, as long as there's um, bile acids floating around at a higher concentration, any tissue that has uh, TGR5 receptors in there everywhere uh, can get upregulated at least temporarily, and then you might start to see the inducement of more hypothyroid symptoms. So it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, again, it's one of those things that it could be great for somebody, uh, and for other people's it, other people, it could be problematic. Absolutely. I think the very last one that we want to talk about may not necessarily be hindering thyroid physiology or interrupting it. It just may not be giving the benefit that we're all led to believe. I think selenium is the, you know, thyroid mineral that everybody, you know, it's in all the thyroid supports that, that you see online. Um, and there, there, it's the questionable, is it, is it doing, is it doing you any good at that point? 
Yeah, so I've read a bunch of papers on this and it doesn't look like selenium really does as great a job as everybody thought. Like, hey, if you take selenium, it'll reduce your thyroid antibodies. If you take selenium, it improves the thyroid function. It is a key nutrient for thyroid physiology. It's a key nutrient for glutathione, physiolo glutathione physiology and a number of other reactions. But I don't think, and I see people taking sometimes just too much selenium in an effort to try and force their thyroid physiology or to force their numbers down. Um, if you took it and it lowered your thyroid antibodies and you feel better, that's great. But I don't think that mo for most people flooding the system with selenium is the answer because it's not supposed to be in the body in real super high concentrations and it can be problematic and it may not be doing what, it, what you really want it to do. And so the, I've read a bunch of papers where it just, it doesn't really do, um, there's not a consistent um, correlation with higher selenium levels and lowering thyroid antibodies or significantly improving or changing uh, thyroid physiology across the board. But again, I wouldn't say with any of these things, somebody might say, hey, well, I took it and I felt better. That, that may be true for you, but it's not a global prescription. And so it, you might be taking lots of it or, or taking some and then say, like, maybe I need more to try and improve your symptomatology. If you're taking some and you're not necessarily seeing the changes, again, this is one of those things that more may not be better. And you might be better off putting time and effort into identifying what those stressors are that are causing the issue or just spend more time eating foods that are rich in selenium or even in some of these other things versus pounding away at supplements, right? right. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's huge. And knowing, and knowing your body, if you're taking the supplement and you haven't noticed an improvement or you feel like you're getting worse from it, you kind of have to step back and say, okay, is, is it containing some of these nutrients that we talked about today? Could it be hindering my thyroid physiology? And then asking that question, should, should I stop it? Or finding a practitioner that actually can do the, the right evaluation to determine what's going to be best for you to be on. Yeah. And so it is, it's one of those things that we want to kind of caution everybody, right? Is uh, probably the first thing to do when you're thinking about, you know, what supplement do I need to fix something? Uh, if you're finding that you're taking, you know, more than four or five things on a regular basis, um, uh, minus maybe a good multivitamin, um, but if you're taking, if you're opening four or five bottles every day to try and fix stuff, uh, and you're still symptomatic and still having issues, uh, it's probably not a supplement issue at, at at the foundation, right? There's probably an absorption issue. You could probably definitely work on just start with a whole food diet, right? Look at the things that you're concerned about and say man, I want to get more carnitine in to help my, my fat metabolism. How can I get that in? Well, where's carnitine? Carnitine's in, in meats, right? How about eat some meat? Now, there's an argument that maybe it's hard to make carnitine and that may be difficult to make, but um, I say you start with a better diet and nutrition before we, we spend too much time trying to flood the body with supplements. So that's always, in my opinion, a great place to start. Absolutely, and I would definitely agree with that. Um, so we covered five, right? Yeah. So shorter podcast today. Do we, should we do a bonus or should we just wrap this one up? Let's leave it with five. Let's leave them All with right. five. So we will leave this one with five things. So we talked about vitamin D, carnitine, milk thistle, selenium, and ox bile as the five things that you may be taking to help you improve your health and physiology, but they may actually either not be doing what you want them to do uh, and may not have the, the powerful impact that maybe you read on a blog post, um, or they may actually be creating problems for your thyroid physiology and you probably want to consider that if you're taking them and your, your signs and symptoms got worse, mm -hmm. you may want to stop them and consult with somebody before you just add those in there. Or if you're taking them and you've been taking them for a long time, and you still have the current symptoms, you might want to consider that they're just not doing the job or they may be creating part of the problem, right? Yep. I think right. that wraps it up. All right. So let everybody know where they can find you, Dr. Eric, in case they need some help from a thyroid physiology perspective, where can they find you? 
You can find me at brainandbodyhealthcenter.com. We also have a YouTube page and uh, I have a Instagram account, Facebook. So you can find us on any of those uh, social media routes. Awesome. And uh, you can find my information at rejuvagencenter.com. Uh, Facebook, I think it's Rejuvagen and Rejuvagen Center. There's, I think they have two, my staff's got two sites up there. Um, on Instagram, it's Dr. Eric Balkavage and I think I covered them all. We've got Thyroid Thursdays, so you can Google in the, in, put in Google Thyroid Thursday or go, to, go directly, probably even better, to YouTube and Vimeo and put in Thyroid Thursday and you will see uh, some video posts on topics on thyroid physiology physiology. I think the one that's either released last week or uh, this week was on thinning hair, why people have hair issues. So I think I did a post on hair issues and skin issues with hypothyroidism. So go I think check. I, saw, I think I saw that you have a, a Monday video series too, right? I did. I just started Functional Medicine Monday. So we're on Functional Medicine Monday, we're talking about things, maybe not so much thyroid, but different aspects of things. So I know there's, um, I'm going to do a series on insulin resistance. So we definitely will talk about thyroid physiology there and talk about lipids and cholesterol, because that's one of the biggest things that people, I don't think we understand, right? Is, mm -hmm. Which is what LDL, what's cholesterol, what's HDL, what's VLDL, what are triglycerides and what's the, what's good, what's bad and how do we really evaluate things? It's pretty interesting. It, that when you talk when we talk about blood sugar physiology, I saw this statistic in a paper that the functional or optimal ranges should be between 82 and 88 seems to be the best range. If your fasting blood sugar is between 88 and 94, you've got a 49% increased risk of developing diabetes. If it's between 94 and 100, you have a 233% risk of developing diabetes. And that's not even outside the lab range, right? Mm -hmm. 233%. That's, that's, a, that's a big jump. <laughs> yeah. And so if we're not testing people's glucose, we're not worried about people's fasting glucose until they get to 126. How many people are, being, are just being not, are not aware that they are developing diabetes and they're at a high risk their doctor's like you're under 100 you're great well doc if i'm if i if they're you know in the 90s they they still have high probability of developing diabetes really high especially if it's over 94 so that is really really scary stuff so i'll do a functional medicine monday series on that all right so let's sign off you got things to do i got things to do and and uh we'll let our uh, our listeners get back to doing whatever they're doing. If you have any questions, always reach out uh, to Dr. Erica or myself. You can reach out to us through our offices or through our websites, or you can put a comment wherever you watch the video or listen to the podcast. All right. Absolutely. Everybody, have, a great, have a great day, Dr. Erica and all our guests. We really appreciate you and uh, spread the word. Let others know that we're on here talking about all things thyroid physiology and trying to provide as many answers as we can. All right. Take awesome. Care. You have a good day.